Okay, so here we are. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm Mitch Weisberg, and here we have uh, Sean McCusker, and this is a series that um, that basically I wanted to do because there's a lot of really friend there's friends that I have all across the education spectrum who are doing some really interesting things, especially in light that, um, as uh, President Biden says, the the, the pandemic is over. So we can go back. So we can. So we can live normal lives now. And, I'm glad to hear uh, that's the case. Right? You know, and I thought, you know, so, so let's just hear from the from people who are coming back and um, who I know are really uh, incredible people doing really interesting things. And by the way, if you yourself wanted to, uh, if anybody listening, you know, wants to do this, just contact me, and you know, we can, we can talk about this also. So, uh, Sean, welcome back to uh, real life now that the pandemic is over. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it's over. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I, I'm, I'm looking to try and tweak my lifestyle back to the busy, extroverted, social part that it was before. But I feel mm -hmm. like the world isn't kicking up to speed at the at the rate that I thought it would, right? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like you go out to the world and you've got people in grocery stores. Mm -hmm. that, like the grocery stores are never full. I haven't been in a full restaurant in forever. Right. Um, it's very interesting. So, um, yeah, I... So I've actually been been flying recently, and um, and I've been to restaurants, and I actually went to a baseball game last night, and there had to be thirty five thousand people, forty thousand people at the game. So people are coming back, but it is a little bit different. And with the school year starting this year, I guess when we start there, like what are you noticing? What first of all, what do you teach, and then what are you noticing in school? Well, I. Um, I work for Digital Promise right now. I am a director of professional learning, and our, we're an organization focused on digital equity. Um, we give out devices to schools. In general, if a school joins our program, they will receive over the course of two years, $2.2 million in free devices with LTE connection so the students have access. In many, if not most cases, the students that we serve um, have no other source of internet in their home, right? So this is their connection to the world. I, I love it because... If you think about it, during the pandemic, when everybody went remote, what's a better place to work than a place that's focused on making sure that schools and teachers are effective and connected and have ability to access school and education? Mm -hmm. So in many of the cases, I'd say the vast majority of our schools, without our program, they would not have been able to continue schooling, right? And, and Digital so Promise is a not-for-profit, right? They are a non-for-profit, that's correct. And there are many, many other programs, but I work for the Verizon Inverted Learning Program. Um, and it's an absolute joy to do it. Um, you know, and I've always been an ed tech person and a social studies teacher and um, trying to help people and connect with people. But what's amazing to me is when you visit those schools, now that we are finally able to reach out and connect to those schools, you're seeing kids who have had this device for the first time. I, I met a kid in Wichita He's never had a piece of technology in his hands before. He doesn't have internet in his house. And he got an iPad and within two months started programming using Scratch a zombie game, right? Hmm. This is just like from scratch. And he was so proud to share that with us. And that's, that's the kind of rewarding things that are fantastic about that part of my job. Um, I, I, my fear honestly, if I'm going to go past the joy of it all, is that because we got the government funds to pay for technology and to, to use them, that we have this temporary release where like there's money for technology, people are connected, the infrastructure's in place, and that when that money dries up, you're going to have schools that, whereas before they may never have had connectivity, now they're going to have had an experience with connectivity, but they can't sustain it. So right. what's the sustainability of the advances we've made and what will we do as a country to make sure that all those kids that we got online for that pandemic remain online and connected to the world and learning and opportunities and, and information. Mm -hmm. And we've done that before as a society, you know, just in the U.S. Absolutely. You know, we've uh, we've funded new initiatives and then um, you had all the ballyhoo and all of the headlines and everything. And then and then three years later, when the money dried up, it's like. Yeah. You know, whether there were schools or healthcare right. or whatever, you know, then what? And they just kind of like met the slow death, right? Right. I, I feel like when I go to COSIN uh, conferences, when I go to sessions like that, the sustainability workshops used to be something that was like, ah, what's the newest thing? Now, I just think about you make gains if you don't have people who are thoughtful, caring, and, and thinking way ahead, 
like you can lose those advances, like in a temporary advancement, that's not what we want. We want to mm-hmm. move the process forward, enhance the, the whole experience. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's a huge focus. My, my other focus, because why only work on one thing, which like we said, we're, right. we're getting to the we're like older and we start, want to start having a bigger impact. So um, my partner, Tom Driscoll and I have for about five years been working on something we've called the Modern Civics Project. Um, just exploring what the research is about effective citizenship. My transition and segue to that is that. But wait a minute, I don't, I don't understand this because, like, we're t- we test ELA and we test math citizenship. It's not one of those tests. You know, who cares, right? If it's not on the test. Boss. See, you're going to make me throw stat- statistics out there, right? <laughs> in general, in the United States, from the moment that No Child Left Behind happened, what happened was we reduced the amount of social studies time that the average kid was experiencing between kindergarten and eighth grade by almost 40%. Because we weren't testing, we wanted to promote writing. But I think there's hopefulness in that, right? Like mm-hmm. if in civic education, like we were able to like improve test scores by investing and having every teacher across the curriculum um focus on writing and math skills i was a social studies teacher and i had to have written essays i had to use a rubric that was decided by the english department and i had to incorporate math Mm. so i did economics and i did voter statistics like how many votes can we expect in this particular election like political science math right but um we i think if we do something similar for civics where every teacher is a civics teacher where Mm -hmm. everyone takes responsibility we can improve the situation in our country um, the, I think a huge thing we have to do is there's evidence that on average, 20 to 30% of Americans have stopped talking to at least one person who was close to them prior to our political situation, uh, getting so bad. And that because of that, we're not talking about hard issues. So we're not resolving them or, or placing humanity upon our people who are intellectually, uh, like different from us. Mm-hmm. So discourse, there's so many good resources on effective discourse right now. There's that that's an area of our focus. And I think that these needs, if someone might say, how is like digital equity and civics in any way related? And, you know, Tom and I are passionate that like the, the issue of equity with devices and technology is huge. Equity and effective civic education programs is huge as well. If people don't have access, like the internet, if you don't have access to civic education, like there's a whole host of problems that come up. Like if individuals learn how to access the mechanisms of democracy mm-hmm. in order to solve their problems, they will continue to do so. But those who don't, right. a person who doesn't have effective civic education tends to fall to uh, protests and they uh, revert to petitions or they revert to, um, you know, being angry, frustration and not or knowing these, how to solve it. Or these wild swings. It's like, People exactly who supported right. um, Barack Obama, who exactly. then voted for Donald Trump when, you know, they were both talking right. about change, but they were both, they were each talking about change in right. diametrically opposite directions. Right. And and to me, like there's, there's like people can call that shift from Obama to Trump insane, but in that is a need and in that is a neglect where people are like, I have a thing that I need and I'm not getting it. But part of that is because no one's just going to come to you. People come to voter bases. People adjust policies to the masses where they see that there's need. But Mm -hmm. think about this. If you're a child and you have no quality civic education and you have no practice being a citizen at a young age, of course, you're not going to know what to do. You know, Um, my analogy is this. So so I thought like being a citizen just means that you understand that there's three parts of the government, right? There's the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. Is there anything more that you need to know? I'm being a little sarcastic. uh, uh, Absolutely. But the fact of the matter is, even at the best, right now, there's been an increase in people who can can identify three branches of government just because of the contentiousness and the news and the elections and the protests. Mm -hmm. However, still, only 40% of Americans at best in the best poll can identify all three. And 60% don't know, right? 60%. In, wow. in in depending on which polls you're looking at, right. yes, it's good. Wow. Like it's it's actually a very conservative guesstimate to say 60% don't know. So my my analogy is this, Mitch. 
if you were to take the best teachers and the best online programs, the best PowerPoint you've ever seen, and you were to create a virtual course where a person learns how to swim, if it was a loved one, if it was a grandchild, a child, someone you care about, would you let them go on a virtual platform to learn how to swim? And then when they complete it, we can even have an advanced course, like advanced online swimming. Would you let them jump in the pool? Would you let them jump in the deep end? Okay, you're, it's a little bit unfair because as long as I was next to them, yes, because I would right. be confident that, um, right. you know, they probably couldn't swim, but um, but maybe they could. And if they couldn't, I'd be right there and, and I'd, and I'd be make a fun for them. Right. Civic education in the United States, I argue, is exactly that. It is a virtual course. Because at no point, in most, statistically speaking, most students will go through all of their civic education from K through 12 and never participate in a debate. Mm -hmm. Most students will participate, 60 to 70% of most students' civic instruction is lecture or discussion. Right. In the classroom, talking about scenarios with a teacher's perspective of what would take place. But we can do so much better. Like a pool, the first step, the first part of day one of swim lessons is get kids in the pool. Right. And, right. And then once they're in there, you can teach them the skills necessary to thrive within the pool. So what we what I would advocate for, what Tom, my partner and I and what we brought up in our book, right, Becoming yeah. Active Citizens, is that our civic education programs have to be participatory and active. Mm -hmm. And they can't wait till senior year. Most civic education programs take place if they take place twice at the end of eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And at the end of senior year, just in time before people vote. By the way, but can you just show that book again? Can you show the book again? I, I just want to make sure that it's you leave it up citizens. there. Okay. Yep. It's Becoming okay. Active Citizens. It's published by Solution Tree Press. Um, so we can, um, if, if we, a kid can be a citizen well before they can vote. The second you have social media, you can participate in civil discourse. And are our kids prepared for that civil discourse, true discussions before they're a citizen? Because young people are participating in elections. They can serve as election judges. They can be out there as part of an agenda. Young kids can petition their government for changes. They can be active solving problems within communities. And if we were to take civic education and reimagine it as a participatory exercise where you participate directly in democracy, then we know that kids, when they get to the next phase of their life, when they get to when they're older and they have a problem that is not a small community issue, they can use that to activate the wheels of democracy as a solution. Right. So when you talk about participatory and um, and civics, it's not just on a national level either. Right. I mean, so to a certain extent, a school is a government institution and you can participate mm -hmm. in the governance of the school your town or village or uh yeah. county are um our government organizations or a Absolutely. slew of different government organizations your state right. so so maybe so like how would you in schools get get kids to start participating on that level okay it, when I'm working with schools, when mm -hmm. I'm asked to come to a school and help them to reform their program, there's a lot of things I'm going to do. The first thing I'm going to do is ask them, what does their student government do? And I'm going to perhaps offend people, but student government as we know it Wait a minute, is not it's my, government. It's my job to offend people, not yours. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'll back her down. But okay. student government isn't government. Planning a dance is not government, right? Planning right. a dance is a social committee. But we call those people government, and I think it's a misnomer, and it's distracting, and it's just not accurate. What if we were to have our student government participate on committees as equal members for things like social emotional health? What if we were to have them talk about what the stresses are and how we could create spaces within the day to help kids to not be so anxious? Like the, the statistics on student anxiety and depression are like through through, especially after COVID. Mm -hmm. When we're trying to solve that problem, are we putting kids involved? And that's just one really easy way. But like you said, the low hanging fruit of government involvement is a school is a government entity in most cases, except for charters and private schools. Um, the principal is a government official in like not even a little bit. It's just absolutely true as our teachers. So participation at the school. But then the next one is local governments like cities, park districts, and libraries are super eager to have people participate in 
giving feedback for what will be purchased, in attending meetings and, and chiming in on particular events that are happening. Are kids today aware that they can go to the library and be a part of the discussion about whether books should be banned or not? Hmm. Right? Like, why wait? Um, and, and so be a part of that conversation. Like, there's a lot of people right now who are saying, like, people are too active. Um, because they're saying that there's these moves to like take over school boards and whatnot. So regardless of people's beliefs and how they feel about that, all that is, is a grassroots initiative to be active within the community. So like ideal ideology aside, what they're doing is a textbook case of how to engage and participate. And right, like there, there might be some reprehensible groups out there. There's some that are mainstream that are out there. But the fact of the matter is deciding that you're going to organize your folks to attend those meetings, to participate, to own the seats that are part of it. Like That's what we've always been asking kids to do. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I think that there's some some possibilities and opportunities to watch what's going around us and say, well, if everybody is doing that, we're all engaged in a really great discourse rather than shutting people down and, and being at each other's throats all the time. Mm -hmm. So do you have some examples of where you've done that with schools? Um, I can think of a bunch of different examples where people are doing something excellent. Uh, okay. An example from when I was in the classroom was the school, the district, uh, the, the local community, the city asked the schools to participate in reviewing the plans that they had created for um, uh, their downtown reimagining of their city. Mm -hmm. And when they were talking to people, when they talked to the adults, the adults were saying things like, we need to have uh, uh, parking garages because there's just no parking. No one stays because you can't get there. When they talked to the kids, they looked and the kids were saying, you're going to ban us from going here. We can't skateboard. You won't let us ride our bikes and there's no place to park our bikes. Then you couldn't even walk the bikes. So they actually got the, the city uh, planners to readjust and increase dramatically the number of uh, bike racks that were available, right? Mm -hmm. uh, another example was that they, they pointed out if there could be a place where there's lockers, no, no business in town, the businesses wanted kids there, but they didn't want the kids there with their backpacks. But the reality is the time between dinner, when they release from school and dinner is like prime time for those kids to come and spend their right. Own. Mm -hmm. And so they were, they were able to work out some changes in um, where the bike racks were so that they mm -hmm. were closer, um, changing the rules. Like, really, why can't we have a skate? Why can't you walk a bike down the street? And that led to changes. And so um, there's other examples. So there's an example from California where a group, uh, a club after school was trying to get their kids engaged to solve a problem. And they had a group of girls design a solar powered tent for homeless people that the city would give away. Because it meant that the kids, their friends who were becoming homeless when the financial crisis hit, right? Um, their friends could, could be homeless, lose their apartment, but their parents could still charge their phones. The, they as students could still charge their phones and communicate and be connected and have a phone number that they could be reached at. Hmm. And, you know, that kind of solution, like those girls created it, marketed it and sold it to cities who were using it today. That's fascinating. And um, I, I, so I guess there's, there's a, a couple of things there. First of all, in your, in, in, in your book, you outline for teachers and, and that's what you've been working on for the last couple of years is, pull, is pulling together yeah. the materials for the book. So you're outlining for teachers or is it just for districts um, on things that they could do to yeah. increase citizenship? Uh, it's funny when we when we started our vision was just for teachers but what we realized was like the teachers want to do it structurally they're limited right mm -hmm. structurally right. there is no cohesive plan too often civics programs across grades across subject areas are ad hoc they're thrown together by teachers who are like we could do this thing let's do this as a one-off if you had a coherent plan for each of the departments to have a civics component within their lessons across time over the course of the, say, a K through eight district, mm -hmm. you're gonna do far better, right? And, and it's gonna be a lot more interesting for the kids also because exactly. they, they're not, you know, they're, the right. kids aren't just looking to learn algebra, you know, they're looking yeah. for something that, that touches their lives. So if they're learning algebra in order to right. solve a, uh, a, a problem that they care about, which is more bike lanes or uh, more places to park their exactly. bikes or, or skate 
uh, parks and stuff like that. Right. Right. And so one of the things that we're finding is like, okay, places where this happens, like people will say, so I, right now there's an incensed teacher somewhere who's like, I got so much to do. And now you want me to teach civics. I feel like you might be teaching it anyway. You're just not being explicit. For instance, if you're uh, uh, in a, um, in a course that teaches cooking or one of those like family services type courses where they're teaching sewing or whatever they're teaching. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to say that the units of measure for recipes are all decided by the government. A gallon in the United States is different than a gallon in Canada because of that difference, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, where do those differences exist? You can talk about how the standards for what we should be eating are set by the government, which is heavily influenced by the food industry. Right. We, right. Th there's a reason it was politics that led to when America wanted to tr like improve the diet of Americans, we sprayed cereal with vitamins. Right. We right. could have bought fruit and given it to people, too. But we're like, well, that's really hard. How can we do this drive? But it's the politics that led to like cereal for breakfast. And then it, it stayed because cereal was where you got your vitamins, too. And the government subsidized a lot of that work initially. So mm -hmm. everything from eating breakfast to cooking, um, like there is a component of government that's involved. And if we can identify those things and call it out and make it explicit mm -hmm. to see how it interacts with other subject areas, it's really, it, it's, it's a lot more meaningful to people. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not all just to do it, right? Like we need to do it well. It should be coherent. It should be thoughtful and um, well-planned so that people know which part of that lift they're going to carry. Right. It is a, like research indicates that when civics only takes place in one class, in one department, it fails. It doesn't work. Right. right? And I'd argue that this, that, you know, and it's not just civics when math only takes place in one department, Agreed. when 100%. English only, you know, when literature only takes or writing only takes place in one department, when, you know, social studies, um, right. science, it's like, really it's you know when you're you know you think about your life outside of school yeah you, you don't sit down and say oh i'm going to be doing i'm going to be doing math right now you think i'm going shopping right now okay and and i can afford this right. amount of money and um or you know and i have these nutritional needs so that's you know bio you know biology Sweet. that's math that's culture because you're buying cultural things uh, you, cult, you know, foods that fit into your culture is so, so it all fits yeah. together. So, and, and then uh, I usually will start off, usually the, the, the conversation that will get a school to call us, like uh, Tom Driscoll, my partner, he um, runs EdTech Teacher and he's created a, a civics component that he does. I do individual speeches or work independently with schools in much the same way. Statistically speaking, Research shows that A, if you teach a kid to become engaged in the, the, the processes of democracy, mm -hmm. there is a trickle up effect. That trickle up effect means that their parents will start to vote in increased numbers. Their parents will become more engaged. In fact, the community, including people in the community who are not associated with the kid who's in the school, mm -hmm. if you have an effective civic engagement, the whole community trickles up and it, a rising tide lifts all boats. But mm -hmm. then even more so, a kid who has had effective civic education is way more likely to know where to go to resolve issues that they're struggling with, which results in they tend to be more happy. Within their jobs, they tend to get promoted more mm -hmm. and stay longer mm -hmm. um, than other people who are not a, a similarly associated. You yep. get to a place where there's high civic engagement, the life expectancy tends to be higher. And so there's like endless statistics about how it benefits people but like mentally healthy because they know how to resolve issues that sit there before them and and that part really rewards me um you know sometimes you go into a school and you're trying to teach like the math teachers from fourth grade about how they might incorporate civics and at first they may not care but ultimately i believe this we go into teaching because you want to serve kids you want to help them to make their lives better richer. And for me, I've always said, everything I do is designed to give my own children more choices in life, not less. Mm -hmm. I never want you to get to a choke point and say, I only have this one choice. So uh, when we talk about the data, when we talk about why it's important to have active, engaged lessons and not lectures and discussions, I, I think people are won over. And I'm really inspired by the fact that it, 
people see the value right now, right? No, I don't think we want to live in the contentious society we, we live in right now. Right, I think we're right. on the tail end of, of, of our acceptance of like the, gr- the, the gritty, um, uh, unkind, like constant leveling attacks. And I think at some point we'll see that come out in how people are campaigning and whatnot. But key to that is if we never formally teach kids how to participate respectfully in a conversation mm-hmm. about politics, how can we be surprised when they fail at that? Right. right? Yep. yep. You know, we have uh, um, a lot of times the other technique that I actually love is debate. But I think that debate does something that I don't like. And I think we should use it less. And that's that in a debate, the participants are designed, are in a situation where the goal is to win. Right. It's right. to, right, to, to level. To out, the, out logic the, the other person. Exactly. But the and fact in real life, is. In real life, yeah. you never win by doing that. You never. Exactly. You, yeah. Like right. how and many so, of us have ever tried to out logic our spouse? Like it doesn't work, right? Right. And and if and honestly, a lot of winning a debate is grandstanding and like timing and like can you drop a joke? Because you can win over the crowd. Right. 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 And yeah. I think we all I think we can all see sometimes a lot it's pretty easy easy to toss logic aside if it's emotionally mm-hmm. satisfying enough. Well, and to learn how to right. have a conversation where um where you're actually using the uh the cognitive tools that that Absolutely. help you influence another person rather than defeat another person even so Absolutely. so like the you know i mean i'm going like two different i'm thinking about two different things but you know there's this uh um this individual named john boyd who developed something called the you know ooda loops and um what he said which basically echoed really what uh, you know a number of other thinkers have said is you know you never you can't actually defeat somebody <laughs> your goal is to win them over and you mm-hmm. win them exactly. over emotionally you don't win them over logically and to learn how to to learn you know the the techniques for winning somebody over emotionally which means you know because we're all pretty intelligent beings we can see if yeah. somebody's trying to snow us so you're you're never going to win me over by snowing me but if you can establish rapport with me and i feel that you're genuinely interested in me absolutely and listening to me I'll be willing to listen to you and maybe we'll come up with something that meets both of our needs rather than the things that we were thinking of that only met one of our needs and really made the other into a loser. So the first of all, I love what you're saying because I, I'm a true believer that if in the course of victory, you in, entrench uh, an enemy, you're just setting yourself up for future defeats, right? And that's yep. kind of yep. what ends up happening in an all out win or lose debate. I'm a big fan of, of um, doing dialogues. Mm-hmm. models for dialogue if you're a teacher and you do debates try a model for dialogue the one i love to use is the one from teach different it's a website it's a, a it's a, a passion project for uh two friends of mine who are twin brothers it's a very simple create a claim that you get a quote historically or a news article mm-hmm. you create a claim a counterclaim, and then you have a discussion about implications it, and it's a fantastic way to change the tone from winning to clarifying what the sides could be, delineating the arguments, right? Um, Trying to find out. Key to a dialogue is the concept that you're trying to find where where you share things in common, right? Like what are the things that we hold together? Rather than like in a debate, you're trying to define the chasm. Mm -hmm. And in a dialogue, you're trying to fill the chasm by saying, here is where we are together. Here are the places where we coexist. The purpose in a debate is not necessarily to listen to the details. It's to make sure your point comes up on top. In a dialogue, the purpose of the discussion is to gain awareness and understanding, to um, understand and gain a sense of nuance. And right. honestly, that's that's the moment that I stopped everything and changed the title of my chapter on debates in my book to dialogues. Because it's that understanding of nuance, like the technicalities, the details of it. And mm-hmm. whether you change a kid's opinion is irrelevant. Mm-hmm. I think parents are more welcoming to it too. It's like, when it's over, you don't say, did you win or lose the debate? When it's over, right. it's like, did you gain an understanding of the people who disagree with you's viewpoint? Mm-hmm. And to me, that's just like medicine we need. Yep. So, um, so I'm going to just use that just as a, because those are, 
those happen to be the techniques that are covered in my mind shifting course where <laughs> the mind shifting course and i'll just i'm going to uh, uh, briefly share my screen to to show this and the purpose was not for me to to do this but it since it came up so you know the purpose of this course is first of all how do you change your own mind so that you're more attuned to being able to um to function effectively and second how do you change how do you work with others so that you both end up working on the same side rather than you both end up um you know fighting each other and so in this course is really designed for teachers um, not just for for the teachers themselves to be using in their own lives, but even more so for the teachers to be able to incorporate these techniques in order to teach kids. And I think that that um, and I'll come off that you know for for right now. Yeah. But that that course uh, starts October 18th, and it's it's eight 90 minute sessions to you know um, going into those those different types of techniques. I think that you know I I, I think that falls into a lot of what you, what you were talking about also. Yeah, and I, I, I feel like there's a huge demand for things that bring us together. Mm -hmm. And while I don't know that that's reached politics yet, I, I, I know for a fact that people feel the divide. Right, and, yes. And it did something really unique, which is it got inside of our families. And when you have that divide go from being a political divide to being like a personal divide, mm -hmm. I think we, we start to say like, now it's time for us to do something. What can we do different? Right. right? So if I were going to sum up, it's that you know, we need to be able to talk to each other. We need to be mm -hmm. able to communicate, but also to stop and listen, even when we disagree. And um, really what I will hope to accomplish with the book is just to get the idea across that citizenship is more than voting. Citizenship is, you don't have to vote to be an effective citizen, although it's really important, right? There, there are things that you get to do, like jury duty. Like there's mm -hmm. rights that you gain and that's what we focus on, but there's responsibilities as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and like, if we can get a sense of what are the things that I owe back, right? Mm -hmm. And what are the things that that um, I can do to be a participant in this democracy before him? My, my favorite, favorite um, point of discussion is that in, in this is, as a, as a concluding comment, this works. There's a Canadian... Uh, a researcher, he's a psychologist, his name is Sean Rosenberg. And in 2019, he went to a conference and he delivered a paper that's called Democracy Devouring Itself, The Rise of the Incompetent Citizen and the Appeal of Populism. I encourage you highly all to go out and find it. I'll drop the link in the chat on the Facebook Live uh, recording. Um, ultimately, his, his conclusion was, he does not believe that democracy will sustain itself another century because... Um, Democracies, specifically the United States, have failed to prepare the future citizens to properly participate in a democratic society, and they're going to hand them basically the steering wheel to a car they don't know how to drive, right? I argue it's not too late and that we've done crazy, ridiculous things. We've transformed our situations. And if we were to invest in saying that like one day when I have to step away, I want that next generation of people to be capable of taking the reins, mm -hmm. right? Right. There, there are people calling our country a gerontocracy now because the leaders are mm -hmm. so old and the population is so old because of the bubble of the baby boomers and that there's a whole nother generation. So let's assume that part of that is true. Uh, one, at some point, our leaders will become younger and younger and the center of our population will be a different group. Are they ready? Will they be ready to go in with like, a clear purpose and not just an agenda. And right. that's really what I hope to gain is to, to make it something to elevate the need for that in education. Mm -hmm. So you're addressing the, you know, the digital divide on the one mm -hmm. hand, okay, with um, mm -hmm. digital promise, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you're, and then there's this also divide between the people with power and the people who don't know how to exercise their power that you're addressing, mm -hmm. um, you know, through uh, or the active or the like the citizen, the active citizen and the inactive. I call it the civic divide if you want to, right? Right. It's like, are you participating? You can have tons of power, you still only get one vote. But the fact of the matter is your vote that we push so hard is only as significant as like its ability to message, right? Like 
Ever since Citizen United, if you want to become active and get a bill passed, it doesn't mean you get people to vote for it. It means that you create a marketing campaign and you share the need and you educate folks and you move the needle on the conversation to influence government to get the change that you right. need. Right, right. And I would argue that change in our world requires more than your one vote every four years, right? Yep. Even It requires even more than one vote every year. So absolutely, there. absolutely. Right. Yeah. Fast, fascinating. So, uh, so uh, I, I, I hope you're successful. You know, and I. <laughs> you people. Um, I hope. I hope a lot of people, you know, read. Um, you know, becoming active citizens, um, and start implementing in their classes, and and you know, con, you know, and the schools and teachers contact you and how to get involved with either digital citizenship or to providing, you know, a, uh, digital access for underserved mm -hmm. populations. And uh, obviously, we'll keep in touch, and you know, let let us know how you're doing. Thanks okay. a lot. I appreciate. It. Final word. Yeah. When you and I first talked, the first time we ever got on a, on camera and talked, we were talking about virtual reality because I'm a big AR VR fan. In terms right. Of opening right. Yeah. Things up. A key concept in virtual reality really led me into parts of my discussion on civics, and that idea is situated cognition. Knowledge is not separate and independent. It's socially constructed and it's connected to its surroundings. Yep. If, if you put a person in VR goggles and give them a view that's underwater, regularly they will hold their breath, even though they're not in the water, because their mm -hmm. knowledge of what to do in the context is triggered. And we need to do that for our kids. So if we could take civics and citizenship and change it from something that's a knowledge that they possess into a knowledge that they've experienced because they've been in this situation, participating will be less intimidating. And it will influence who participates right now without, I probably don't have to go into it. There are a lot of people left out of this process because their communities are typically underserved in terms of civic education. Right. And, and people who are able to access the mechanisms of democracy to create change will. And I think that's my favorite part. It's like people's needs will be served through them being engaged in this process. And it's better for all of us. So I hope that we can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, thank you. I'm going to end the recording.